welcome everybody to the Monitor Keeping Podcast, and we're here with Chris Foley for round two. So, been excited about this. We had to put it off for a little bit uh, just because everybody's schedules, but we're back. And uh, you see, <laughs> you guys can't see what I'm seeing, but there's a croc monitor right over Chris's shoulder, just tongue flicking the heck out of him. So, is that is that cage still open? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That thing's right up on your shoulder. Okay, yep. so. That's cool. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, just simply amazing. This this animal is so uh, inquisitive and laid back from the looks of it. You know, this is not the time yeah. for a loose rat to go running through the building. <laughs> Dude, uh, me and Alan are, are, you know, we're monitor guys and we bring this to you, but we're scared of these things, croc oh, monitors. I, yeah. And it's, they're not even scared. It's that amount of respect that you got to really give to them. Yeah, and um, you know, yeah, even funny, ones that I can... know. What happened? Now, let's say you can you can call me an idiot for this, probably, but I spent the majority of my morning uh, cleaning the rodent barn, so I'm sure I smell like it. <laughs> but uh, oh she, she knows the difference. That's amazing. Yeah, and I yeah, think she's that's, she's that's sitting cool. around wondering if there's a rat here, but. She knows what I am. Yeah, even the ones that I see that are tame, or the ones that are, you know, people say hey, they're they're very uh, they're very docile animals, and you know, these people are carrying them on their shoulders. I, I still don't. I, I still not to try try not to be complacent around those guys, just because you know shit can happen, an animal can get started. Can. Or, yeah, I, I can tell there's a lot of work done with this animal. Uh, yeah, yeah. Most of mine are are taste first, but they are a lot smaller. So, <laughs> oh man, that is an impressive animal. Um, yeah, and just to, just to see what's going on with that animal, tongue flicking, and the, the way it's tongue flicking too. It's like the short little flicks that are just what's out there, what's going on, what are you? Um, yeah, it's it's impressive. So kudos to you guys over there. You and uh, the rest of the crew. Um, yeah, the, the cool thing about her, so this is, um, I think I said it before we started recording, this is Desiree and Steven's animal, this is Kilo, and they got her as a little one, and she got a lot of interaction as a young one, and, and, and kind of less so as she got bigger, but mm-hmm. like, once that trust was gained, like, she, she's just had this recognition that, like, it never got lost. Like, we don't take her out that much. When yeah, we go in the sprayer yeah. and to feed her, we let her do this. We let her come out and walk. And if there's a place that we post this podcast, like on Facebook, I can take a little video of this later so people know what we're looking at. But, yeah, she just kind of uh, learned what it was, and then it, it didn't take a whole lot of reinforcing. And that wasn't yeah. that hasn't been my experience importing bigger animals. Yeah, yeah. That's taken a little more patience. But now, is this the female that animal. laid? No, this is a different one. Oh, the yeah. The female that laid at the home. And she's okay, but she's she's pretty skittish. I can hold her, but she won't yeah. do this. Yeah. I was like, even a how old is how old size. That? Go ahead, Kai. What's that? No, how, how old is that one? Uh, how, how old is that I don't one? know, actually. She's, she's similar size to, to mine, and I think mine is about f- five years old or so. But I'd have to ask them. She's always been this size as long as I've known her, but I haven't been here all too long. What are you saying, Alan? Up on your head. <laughs> Even even just that that method of crawling up on your head with those size claws is uh, you could wear a couple yeah. couple little stripes through the holidays. <laughs> yeah, it's the only thing I miss about having longer hair. Now yeah. everything gets on my head and it comes right to my scalp. Oh, I see your your hoodie picks all the time. You're in there uh, looking like you're robbing the place. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, first... one time I got a nail. I got a nail that almost pierced all the way through my ear. Oof. And yeah. ever since Ouch. that happened, I've tried to do the hoodie or a hat. I'm actually taking some pictures on oh. my phone of this because uh, 
Yeah, the, the yeah. picture's not coming through well, so it really looks like a blob on on my side. But yeah, that's that's uh, that's really that's, that's really cool though. You should take a selfie right now, bro. You should take a <laughs> selfie right now, Chris. Oh, you got, you're using your phone, huh? No, I'm don't worry. I'm getting laptop, it. I'm getting a little the room. <laughs> quick video of this oh, okay. interaction. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah, too bad. Uh, too bad the listeners won't really be able to see this at all. But, um, you know, the the episode is is really just Chris Foldy number two. But, you know, he does a lot of variety of species of reptiles and from snakes and you know scrub pythons and different types of monitor lizards. Um, oh and no, even no, it's with, not just uh, Chris Foley number two. You guys have done so much in what the last month since we recorded the last one. Yeah, there's, there's a lot yeah. more going on that we're going to get into now. So <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot more going on. Um, and really, it's not you know, um, I didn't really expect it to go that way, but it really did. Um, I myself took some losses this year and lost a couple of females. Um, I rehow after that episode. Ever since Chris said that he needed a male um, Indonesian type of mangrove monitor, I basically sent him one of mine, um, Little Ermius, that I produced in 2020 during the very pe- beginning of the pandemic. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's that's to him now, which basically freed up three enclosures for me. And so then um, I went ahead and got myself a new coli to replace one of the females that passed away. And then um, during that time, during that time, another friend was uh, recommending that I look at these other monitors that were at underground reptiles for months. I, I would say almost maybe four to five months that they were sitting there and I just I didn't budge on them at first because they were they were priced pretty high. I think they were priced at like fifteen hundred each at that time, or twelve hundred each or something like that. And so you know, I just I said, hey, I'm not gonna run into any other projects. So <clears throat> I really didn't do anything with those during the first time I looked at them, even if they looked different. Um, and the pictures that were on the ad were horrible. They didn't really show how well the animals looked in person. <laughs> so so I, I, I really discarded them as as wanting to work with them just because I didn't get a <clears throat> a good idea of what they looked like, but also because underground is known for not really you know, they're known for some pretty horrible stuff in the past. And then, you know, they're not really communicative on sending pictures. You just buy it and it gets sent to you. You know, that's really it. It's not it's not one of those where you get really personable with them. They send you a bunch of pictures and, and things like that yeah. at all. So, yeah. um, you know, then I, uh, went ahead and essentially talked with Chris about it. Um, I didn't really know that they were going to come to me until he just said, Hey, you're going to get a present. And <laughs> I, I ended up getting, a, I ended up getting a present. <laughs> so, um, I ended up having to uh, get those guys <coughs> when he got them, and he sent me pictures from Very cool. what I'm used to with underground, from the ads that they posted, and from the pictures he sent me on, upon receiving, they looked entirely different, 100% different in animal looking pattern, color, and um, they're basically like a... a Highlighter green color with some yellows, and um, I don't know. I don't know how to describe them. They're just a lot smaller than all the other mangrove types, right? Most of them get most mangroves get like three to four feet. Some will stay around like two and a half, three feet, but these I think are going to stay right around two feet long. I, I'm hoping they do. Yeah. Um, so judging be judging by awesome. the pattern of the bigger one. Yeah, judging by the pattern of the bigger one, judging by the one that Brian Daruka has, that's uh he's had it his for a while. And um when mangroves are born, they're born basically black with a bunch of little spots, right? Yeah. And those coloration in spots um 
that's what the hue of the animal is going to be. So let's say if it's a black background with orange spots, the hue of that animal is likely going to be orange. If they're, you know, bright yellow spots, the animal is likely going to be yellow. And then as it fragments, the black dissipates, you'll see colors that come in between that, and that's going to be the undertone. Not 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 the overall hue, but the undertone as far as the colors in between the the black fragmenting and and what yeah. what the base color kind of is going to look like, but the hue is like the shimmer and shine that the animals give off when it's you know shining at a different light, a different angle, you know, in and out of the sunlight, and uh, very very pretty. So these animals only at about a foot and a half almost two feet long they're not they're barely even two feet they're more like 20 inches right now um their 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 pattern is already fragmented right especially the bigger one that i have and when i say bigger he's really only like 18 inches 20 inches long so he's not very big at all and most of his spots have already fragmented and dissipated where then they now have the that matrix look and it's just a bunch of little lines everywhere right and he no longer has the ocelli and and those major spots and the black background is dissipated and so he'll probably grow out of more black and become almost like a i don't know like a a silverish look right and um silver yellow yeah, quite so has information on like the size of the wild ones uh, he said they're going to stay pretty small, but I, I honestly don't think he's kept them for long. I, th I know he's worked with them um, at um, at uh, when he went to go to Angola. I think that's what the, the island name is. Um, but I know he's seen them in the wild, and um, but brought some over. I don't really think so. Only because he's also he's he's asked for if we have surplus or anything like that, and and I told him we did it, but um, I don't think he has any. I don't think he's played with them uh, far as far as other than when he was there, um, describing them and doing whatever paperwork he's done with them and things like that. So, um, so is he is he aiming for a new subspecies with these? I like I have no background on these other than you know what they've already been. I don't know if. So it's not on paper yet. The description. That's why when we when we write Dwyer I, we kind of always put the quotes around it, right? Just because it's not yeah. like full. It's not foolproof yet that they're you know described as him. It's just when I sent him pictures, he's like, yeah, those are them. And then John and and another another person that knows Mark Bayless, uh, rest in peace, Mark Bayless. Um, Mark Bayless had one. Uh, for years and this thing was like barely two and a half feet so uh, very very small animals um from what i can from what i can gather for everybody else you know saying things and and um and these these are these aren't just nobodies you know mark bayless is putting in a lot of work for the monitor community back then when we were kids you know and um and and uh Ketzel dwyer himself who the, who, the, who the monitors are named after, has done a lot of work with monitors overseas in Costa Rica and in America as well. So mm -hmm. these are two really trustworthy people. Um, and then also what John Ag Agdrana has gathered as well. <clears throat> so these monitors were just sitting there. We didn't really know what they were until we got them. And then, you know, we started sharing their pictures and... Um, and so, yeah, we have, I've had, I have these two and um, you guys have might've seen Mike Stefani post up another one on his page. And we also have that one coming as well. Um, okay. So that I was, was wondering uh, about that, that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. We didn't jump on that initially. When I saw that one on the ad, um, I was, I was already, I, I had already purchased the Russell Island. So that is another Solomon Island species that I'll talk about in a second. But um, the Russell Island is uh, just another mangrove monitor in the Solomon Island fragments of, you know, islands. Um, but um, the one that we have coming <clears throat> basically 
hours before Chris was going to get it and basically sold. And whoever oh, got that, um, yeah, whoever got that one, we uh, we ended up, you know, seeing seeing my, yeah, we uh, we we slipped the ball on that one because I should have bought that one immediately. Um, yeah, but you know, I went ahead and got the Russells just because they looked really different and they still are pretty amazing looking. So I, I I'm not going to stub myself in the foot for that one because those are really cool animals as well. But um, working with so, the Dwyer eye. <clears throat> Um, Real quick, was this all coordinated yeah, um, with you and Chris? Chris, or uh, did you come up on them separately? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, basically, like I said, Chris, I didn't know that they were gonna. I like, I didn't know that they were gonna be coming to me. The first two Dwyer, I. So mm-hmm. then Chris was like, "Hey, you know, you're expecting a box," and and then I kind of, I kind of made him tell me the truth because I, I wanted to prepare for them, you know. Um. So, but yeah, he's <laughs> like, "Yeah, man, you're gonna, you're gonna get a surprise," and. I, I said, I like surprises, but damn, it's got to be something I, I got to be prepared for, you know. Um, Chris, just because there's a whole lot address. going on here. I just want to make sure that Chris has yeah. my address. If you need anything, it just, yeah, man. you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> Christmas so, cards but, or whatever. <laughs> um, now this is where, you know, me and... Hey, be careful. If Jane is making Christmas cards, you're going to get a picture with my big, ugly face on it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Let's uh, take it to the fridge over there. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, Chris and I have been, you know, friends for a, wh- a while now. I would say a good, a good year or two. And um, you know, it started with the introductions with just mangrove stuff and asking questions. And I myself, you know, not not to not to be a prude, but it takes a little. I'm like an onion. I need to be peeled back slowly. You know, so um, it takes a. Uh, regular consistency, things like that. And that's how we developed a friendship. And, you know, I'm helping him with his stuff. He helps me with business stuff. And, and we just work back and forth, you know, just like how how anything does. And it, it's never just like, hey, we're just all of a sudden, you know, like just best friends or something like that. You know, we work. It's all a working thing. And and um, the monitors are involved. The animals are involved. Business is involved. And so, um, yeah, man, it's just, you know, just how it is. And I sent him one of my very prized possessions just not too long ago. And he really just returned the favor almost immediately. And I didn't really expect that at all. Um, but as far as capitalizing, taking advantage of new species that are coming in, a pair to begin with, you know, that's, uh, we just, we don't want it to go to not that in, not that there aren't other people that can take care of them because there are, it's just, you know, we want to try to work with these and right. the work that I have with mangrove monitors already. Um, I'm kind of one of the, the best at bat when it comes to the mangrove stuff. So I really try to hone in on this complex alone um, with the coli, the now Dwyer eye, the Solomon Island stuff, you know, things like that. I, I, I like them all. I've kind of dabble in a lot of stuff with other people's melanists. They're Dorianis. Um, I haven't gotten too much into the peach throats with people a little bit, but, you know, it, it, so it seems like there's always something going on where their peach throats aren't old enough. One dies and, you know, then the project goes to shambles or the person quits. A lot of quitters, man. I, and, it, you know, I, I don't I know there's, you know, things that come into play. Maybe people don't have money to invest in it and continually invest in it or put the years and years and years in but that's what it takes um yeah it it takes years of failing you know if you're gonna think about trying to get rich off of this or or have just money as the only goal in your initial you know year or two you'll likely fail you know (laughs) um it it just it's just it just that's how that's how it works when when i'm working with these monitors you know, I mean, let's just say Chris is working with the croc monitors and it's been years, right? He first just gets them to copulate with nothing and then they lay and they just drop duds, you know, and then they copulate and then lay, you know, and then what's the next step? Possibly hatching out some stuff, you know, and then the next step is getting better and better at it. And it's it, that's how I've, I've had to deal with it as well, where the coli I'll have stuff fight and kill each other. And then, you know, 
stuff works out a little bit better the next round where I get eggs. And then earlier this year, I got one to hatch, but that one also died not too long after a few months. So, you know, it's like, that's like, Hey, we are going to give you a taste, but we're going to take it back, you know? And, um, yeah. So, and I, you know, I get closer and closer and closer, um, until, you know, eventually you hit, you hit jackpot and maybe you get a good clutch or you get to your goal. Um, and for anybody that is out there with their own projects, you know, whatever it may be, it takes a long time, you know, to really, to really get, get in the work. I've been working with mangroves now. I can say for about a decade, ever since I was 22, 23, although I've had them before that, like I really like jumped into it, like over, over addiction, over not having places to live, over everything, you know, relationships and all these things like that. It's like I still put all my effort into um, the mangroves as much as I could just because I, I, I enjoy the species a lot. You know, I had to learn them inside and out as much as I can um, and things like that. So, you know, getting to the next set of stuff where got, we got another dryer eye coming. I have the Solomon Island stuff that are, you know, more imports are coming in that are just random stuff, you know, just just random mangrove monitors. And um, we like to figure out what they are, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, There's a lot of interested people. And they have, they, they themselves, the, the species of mangrove monitors have, um, I would say they've caught some steam. You know, more people are realizing that they're cool or, you know, how to work with them because a lot of people were trying to apply what they do with white throats or water monitors to them when they're just a, a whole different ball game. Yeah. And um, so I'm trying to teach people and teach other people about them and things like that. Just and so, as you know, as more people will learn and these practices are taught all over through the groups and through personal conversations and things like that, I think more and more people will catch on to how to care for these, these shy and, you know, reclusive monitors that essentially nobody really breeds. I I think till today, it's still only a small handful of people that have been working with them, produce them consistently. And it's like me and, um, you know, Brian DeRuca has done Melanis and, there's a couple guys that have done, you know, um, like Charlie Birch has done the uh, spinalosis, and I'm not. Is that is that considered an indicus type? Is it? You know, I don't honestly know. I don't think so, but it, you know, it's just one of those harder types. I mean, it, it looks like it. I, I couldn't, I couldn't really say a hundred percent for sure, but you know, it's one of those things where there's only really a handful of people that are um, achieving success with the mangrove stuff and so it's a, it's a, it's a hard ball game man it really is yeah. the, the one thing so that I want to say about, about like you. about like the um, you know people being discouraged and quitting and stuff like that is like there really is just one recipe to it and that one recipe is to not Get distracted by the market. Don't get distracted by trends. Don't get distracted by what other people are keeping. Yeah. Just keep what you love to keep. Like when I started keeping scrub pythons, when Kai started keeping mangroves, nobody cared about them. Yeah. We didn't we yeah. didn't get into those because there was a trend, because they were we, we got into them because because we wanted to keep them no matter if there was ever going to be a market or not. And then what happens, you make your own market. You are the market. You speak passionately enough about anything for long enough, and someone's going to jump on your train. Right. Um, When I hatched, not hatched, when I I bred the Crocs, I said in in my my main message was like, I didn't know if I'd ever do this, and I I didn't care. I mean, I care. I, I tried. I wanted to do it. But... I would never ever stop keeping them if I failed every year from now until they eventually passed away or I did like it, it it just didn't matter to me because I just love those individual animals that much that they would just be my, 
really space consuming expensive pets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the truth. Um, and failures. Yeah. Like anybody who's done this long enough has fa- like if I asked you how many times you've made a mistake or failed Kai, you can't tell me that number. Yeah. <laughs> you've lost count. You don't try to count it because you don't dwell on it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. And that's exactly what I said about Robert Fox when he just produced these um these Ruticolas, these these black roughnecks. Which yeah, you ever man. figure out if that's a first? I don't know for um, sure. It's uh, one of the first in the United States. I think somebody has done it years ago, um, as far as black roughnecks go. And there was a European guy that did it two years ago, um, but he lost that female right after that clutch hatched out. So, um, you know, getting another female yeah, Robert, on the ball. Robert again. Fox, he's had, he's lost so many eggs. He's had incubator yeah. issues. He had a, 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 an no. electric problem that, that killed a whole those shed are, worth of animals. Like, yeah. He's, he's faced it all things. and just kept coming back. That's how you get this. Yeah, that's how, uh, those are those steps that I was talking about. It's, it gives you a little bit and then it takes it back. It gives you a little bit more and, you you know takes it back it, you you're there it's not going to give you all of it at once you know you you inch yeah. forward what 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 i was kind of telling him because um i kind of i helped him hatch those those uh rudy this out and we're on the phone for hours basically talking about what to do with these things and and um uh, you know just egg egg incubation issues and so a lot of people come to me for that they may have here heard it on the on the podcast or you know just through word of mouth and um, you know, as far as the, the Rudy Colas goes, um, you know, he got to getting eggs and then it's just like where I'm kind of sort of at now with the coli where, you know, the incubating process isn't the greatest. And so we got to figure out what's next. Right. But as long as we know what we're coming from and then to figure out those, those facts, you know, yeah. all right. You know, the eggs are at 170 days. We know they only really take about 170 to 200 days. So we went ahead and he dealt with the first dead egg, right? This egg basically oversweated and um, just started to smell. And then it was black inside. And those were the cues that we needed to then finally go ahead and cut these eggs open. So we cut the first one. Obviously, that was dead. And then he had another clutch that basically went kaput as well. And so we cut those and, um, you know, basically trying to figure out what's going on here. Right. And I don't want to, cause Rob's going to come on in another episode. So I don't want to disclose too much, but really just trying to gather what we got from what's right in front of us, the facts right in front of us, the, the evidence and, and what the animals are showing, what the eggs are showing, all the details, things like that, and getting to the next step. What are we What are we working towards next? You know, um, and so it's just to avoid you know disclosing too much because Rob's going to have his own episode, um, and we'll, we're going to get into that as well. He now has a handful of babies that he says that you know. We put in all the hard work for, spent all the money, you know, redid cages multiple times, tried to get it right, you know. And, um, you know, at first we just had him on it for an episode of trying to do this, you know. And now it's a year later or several months later and bam, it's now a thing where he's honed in on some of the stuff that I've taught him. Some of the things that other keepers have been basically implementing into his practices and how to keep and how to incubate and what to utilize and and you know now the united states has some some baby black roughnecks out there you know and those things are so cute man they're i I almost want to buy one just to buy one that'll always be the case yeah 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 Yeah, man it's so picking up we're we're already spending half an hour just getting into that stuff man i feel like we might need. There's a lot going on with monitors now, right now, man. There's so much going on. Everybody's got, you know, 
projects taking off. Not only is it, you know, somewhat prime breeding season for a lot of stuff, uh, you know, we're not even, we're barely even there as far as, yeah. as far as what all the cool stuff is, is going on in the hobby nowadays. Um, you know, but yeah, Chris, man, the everyday, everyday get up with the Crocs and the Melanists and, you know, let us know what, what's frustrating you lately. That's a wonderful way to put it. Yes, What's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's the truth. So the, the melanist <laughs> tricked me. Yeah. We we thought we got close. Um, there was there was some mating that happened. Uh, feeding cycle was changing. Her body shape was changing. I thought we were getting close. Um, redid the nesting because the last time that I tried, it did not seem like uh, she was really using it a whole lot. Um, this time, it's almost like she was waiting for me to fix it. Like, I redid the nest, and she dove into it and dug, like, four different holes. And even the pictures that I that I sent to Kai, sent to John and Dragna, they're like, man, we're, you're going to get eggs this week. Yeah. She like, really she, looks she's like close. It. Yeah. She really then, did. <laughs> Ta- tail base looked like it was collapsing. She was huge. She was eating ravenously. She went off food. It, it was time. And then I either, you know, they can only do so much with photographs. So me in person, I either uh, got too hyped and read it wrong or, or I made a mistake somewhere. Or maybe she still doesn't like the nesting, but she kind of got a little smaller, went back to eating and completely yeah. left the nest box behind. So I, I think that I think I missed it. I think we're going to try and do some. You know, I didn't do a whole lot of cycling to try and prompt them. I just, I just noticed the courting and then started to to work on the food. Uh, but this time, I'm going to go into the winter and try to do some more aggressive cycling, like I did with the Crocs. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I know, I know, Crocs talk- seem like. Uh, what's that? Oh, I you were just going into it because I was going to just say I know we had talked about Crocs a lot in the last episode, but we went on all kinds of tangents. So. Um, I guess even if you said it on the last episode for, for the listeners, um, if you wouldn't mind going into just condensing it so it's all in one part of the podcast. Sorry, sorry, listeners. I know <laughs> we talk in all kinds of ways. Um, but starting maybe with cooling and going into what you've been doing and, and uh, specifically with the Crocs. You know, you're, you're, what is the Foley recipe, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the one thing that, that I found, and it's with a lot of things, is like you try so many different things that I don't, for the most part, I don't think we ever truly know what the real triggers are. Like I feel yeah. like the, the only way to really find it is several years or several groups of animals where you can do like process of elimination and start pulling things back and seeing what was really effective. But the one thing that I've always felt with these endo animals and a lot of people give me a hard time about them because they live along the equator is um, Mm -hmm. if you pull like the city weather data for like Jayapira, Jakarta, like the the big cities there, like you do see what looks like, you know, equator grade temperatures. It's, you know, 75 to 85 every month of the year. So why are you cooling these things? Well, yeah. that, that data day, that they pull, day. yeah, so that, that data that they pull, yeah. though, like, that's nothing like what it's like 100 feet up in a tree. That's nothing like yeah. what it's down at a burrow of a tree base that never sees sunlight. Right. Um, and I don't or even know case. if we truly have that. But the one thing that, that I can say is, like, the way that a lot of this stuff responds to it, I just can't believe that's not what it is there right like I've, I've gotten a lot of different endo snakes to go from from dropping temperatures it's worked with the crocs um it's worked with you know kai's kind of was already doing the same thing with his stuff and has had success with it um i i really think that if somebody went out there and fuel collected that data you would find that it probably gets unusually cold in some of these shadier or, or wet spots that just don't get you know, the, the sun or the city heat that a lot of this data collection already gets. Yeah. Um, Cause I've taken them down into, you know, into the fifties and they've had the opportunity to get out of it and they chose not to. 
Um, yep. Like they've gone and climbed down into that cold corner and, and hung out because that's where they wanted to be. Like I reeled yeah. in the basking hours. I keep some heat on, you know, overnight just as a safety precaution that, you know, if the fifties or something really is too aggressive for them, they, they can get out of it and they choose not to. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's made, made a difference. Um, I'll tie that into like, a little bit of a dry season. I know the Indo, you know, theoretically being kind of like forest jungle habitat doesn't get like dry, dry. But even if you use the city analysis of, of their rainfall, you can see that there's definitely like a wet season, dry season to right. some extent. And those dry seasons, it's not exactly like, man, when we say dry, people think desert or some woodlands or something like that. Yeah. What it, what it really is is, during the time when it's dry, basically there are no clouds in the sky, right? And so when the sky is clear of clouds and essentially it's not raining, the air and heat that is gathered through the day gets to escape. You know, just like how the forecast is, you know, here, let's just say in California, right? If the forecast is all cloudy and it's been raining, it's actually going to be kind of warm, even if it's winter, right? So, um, like what I just experienced the last two days of full-on clouds, we couldn't even see the sun, but it's warm, you know, and it's humid. And, I, and as I'm looking at my humidity gauge, it's high. It's 75 80% humidity. The clouds themselves, you know, this is not anything that I'm making up. This is real science where these clouds basically trap in the heat. When Indonesia is, or all these other Micronesian islands as well, when there are no longer clouds, that heat gets to escape. And so when it's dry season, if they actually experience the coldest nights of the year there because there's no longer any heat trapped in. So um, that I got from, man, my brain is leaving me, but uh, he just <laughs> passed away. I feel really bad for uh, Danny Gorman. Okay, so um, ah, you know, okay. rest in peace, Danny. Yeah, Dad, rest in peace, Danny. He's an American that lives you know, or lived in Indonesia. So, you know, not that I don't trust other Indonesian people. It's just the communication is a lot simpler. And, you know, we basically speak English and I can, he understands exactly what I'm saying. Not that other Indonesian people can't or don't. It's just, there's already a rapport there of, you know, two Americans kind of working together, one over there, one over here. And he was, you know, showing temperature gun signs and, 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 and all these other things that he was doing out there. And, Basically, I was just talking to him about it, picking his brain on, on what's what, and he explained to me that, you know, the when it's when it's dry season, it's also colder here, so you know, especially the night times, and and he temperature gunned fifty five, sixty degrees on the floor. Now, when we think about temperatures as well, and what these animals are getting into, and what they can go down to, essentially. The weather may be 75 degrees, maybe even 80 degrees, but out of the sun, like Chris was mentioning, into a tree log that's in the ground or something like that, or or because we're working with microhabitus and these lizards, you know, go deep into the ground, into some burrow, all the way down there, you know, those are areas that are a lot cooler, a lot colder. Right. And so that's where it's not even that I, you know, put all these little pieces together. It's, you know, other other keepers helping me and me taking puzzle pieces and adding it here and taking away from here and adding it back to this. And and so then I developed my own little thing. And to kind of make it simple for other keepers to gather, it's like what people, how they breed ball pythons, colubrids, other pythons, other boas tortoises, turtles in North America, um, you know, you basically take them down in temperature and you warm them back up and then they start breeding. That's all mm -hmm. I'm really doing, you know? 
And if when you take stuff down, things are implemented, like no more humidity and hot, dense moisture, because cold and wetness equals respiratory, other issues, things like that, you know? And so that's yeah. where that's where this, this stuff is kind of now we're applying it to monitors. Not that other people and how they're doing their monitors isn't working at all. It's just it's not working for these things. And right. if, if, if it was working for these things, then we'd be breeding croc monitors out of our butts. And I'd be breeding <laughs> mangroves monitors and everybody would do it just like simple, you know, and they'd breed whatever. All these other species that we can't really do on the regular here, now we're getting somewhere. And we're not even there yet. It's just getting closer. We're getting closer and closer to figuring out, okay, what's working? Right. Obviously, that wasn't working for 10, 20 years of just heat them and feed them like it does with some Australian stuff, right? We now are utilizing the sort of like hibernation and brumation. We're taking them down, not feeding them so much. They basically don't go through anything major for like two to three months at least. And then you warm them back up, heat feed them again, and things like that. So, you know, um, I think it's. Yeah, um, man, sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> Well, kind of jumping on what you guys are saying, too, um, being out in different, uh, I mean, you can do this in the U.S., you can do this in other countries, uh, very tropical countries, um, where if, if anyone that's been to, like, the the uh, um, Aztec ruins or something or the, uh, the Mayan ruins down there, um, if you've gone on one of those trips and you, if you, for whatever reason, you're walking through the jungle, Say like your your parking lots over here. You're actually walking through some real dense canopy and everything. They like to make it look a certain way, like you're getting that whole feel. You you go in there and you can feel the humidity. You feel how how hot it gets. And as soon as you come through into this more landscaped area where you're gonna you're gonna climb these rooms or climb the steps up, and you get in that clearing, it's like that humidity's gone. You know, you can still feel it a little bit, but you're gonna catch a breeze. Um, you climb up to the top. You're going to feel that breeze a whole lot better. It's, it's real refreshing up there, you know, and then you got to get back in that stuffy bus with everybody else. It changes. But um, it, it's the same <laughs> thing when you're, you're thinking about, like, say you have a waterway on one point. A waterway is usually a big open area, except for the, the little channels and whatnot that break off. That waterway is a big open area, so you don't, you don't have a big canopy. So when things are close to a waterway, where there's maybe not a lot of vegetation near the uh, the shores of wherever you're, whether it's a, an ocean, like if you're an island or just a, uh, a lake, even a river, um, that's a good way for, for just airflow to get in and out of there uh, at certain times of the day. Certain times of the day, it might just be stuck, you know, it's not moving much. But as the temperature drops the, the in, and there's that natural change in the thermals, like that stuff happens. So where these animals spend their time day and night, you know, where they choose to make their homes, all this is um, something that they have the ability to get to. And what are we really providing them in captivity? Are we providing them that, you know, I, for, for a lot of the Australian species, it's easy for me to keep them 24 seven lights uh, at a certain temperature and just run them. And honestly, they do great, you know, but um, there's other other species, uh, Australian species that we've talked about on other other episodes, even desert species um, like the Spencers. Not a lot of people have the same success as they have with other Australian animals, you know. And then right. we can get Spencers into, just get fat, right? Yeah, they just end up really fat. And then there's all kinds of species in Australia, from from the top to the bottom. You know, I have a feeling that some of these really um, southern uh, monitor species might be different than, you know, middle to northern Australia. And then you get up to, you know, the rainforest area then and you have Dorianus or those type of animals up there. Um, huge changes and stuff. And it's real interesting um, where we are mainly talking monitors. But when you see some of these guys doing work out with the, the green tree pythons over there in Australia, and they're walking around at night and where they're finding these things and what the temperature is actually like, you know, all these animals in that area are experiencing these same things. So how do we learn from one area of the reptile hobby? How do we apply that um, 
And, you know, we get so close-minded that um, sometimes we'll only visit the monitor groups and we won't branch out to pull in that information of these same areas that other keepers have picked up on, same things that are going up in those habitats that they're implementing maybe over here with uh, something like maybe scrub pythons uh, in your situation, Chris, that, you know, it's like, hey, this is working for the, I wonder if, you know, and just mixing these things yeah. around, um, you know, something, it, it could be something as, as crazy as we know that some monitor species like a big tub full of leaf litter. Maybe a snake likes the same thing going the other way, you know, uh, for laying purposes or something along those lines. Um, again, I got talking. We were talking about <laughs> I'm on a tangent. I'm changing this thing from, you know, different uh, ge geographical things and the kind of uh, things they might experience to now nesting. Sort of all, it sort of all implies, though. It is. That's what we're trying to really do here is take all, take all these other aspects from other species and basically apply them, see if it works, you know. Right. But, you know, for example, I take a look at yeah. some of these areas, um, let's say maybe around Alice Springs or something, and we see these cool um, – um, images of something that might be somewhat like a, um, I, w I wouldn't say rainforest, but forested area, but then you have these bluffs in a waterway right behind it, right? Or uh, cliffs or um, little hills or mountains or whatever. Uh, what, what people I don't think sometimes realize is you get on the right side of that mountain where the, the wind's hitting, and that's what those animals are experiencing. They're, they're maybe choosing to go down into that forested part at a certain time of the day or just walk up, you know, um, for them, for, for a Kimberly rock monitor, what it, it's not a big deal to climb 10 feet up a rock face. And now all of a sudden they're getting a, a breeze right in their face. It can change their whole um, temperature gradient. It can change the humidity gradient or at least air contact with the skin at that point, you know? So, um, I mean, these kind of things are all over the jungle. That, that uh, example of the, the ruins was just something maybe humans, we can relate to. But there's bluffs in the jungle. There's those open waterways. There's, uh, at you know, in today's world, there's clear cuts uh, where they find a lot of monitors in these deforested areas. But the thing is, those monitors are using those areas, you know. Um, I, I, I guess I'll stop my little tangent there. <laughs> It's my mind gets going with all this stuff, you know, and uh, yeah, and, so, and also how adaptable these things are. Like someone could really just go out and there's that the real big park in Thailand where all the water monitors are, and just throughout the year take the uh, the temperature, both humidity and temperatures throughout the season at night, right there. Um, yeah, it's it's insanely crazy, you know. Um, I won't I won't get into that story. I spent some time over in Thailand, though, and to experience how the um... – Chris laughed. It's not that kind of story, Chris. <laughs> it's... It's... <laughs> the time I spent in Thailand was on a missionary trip, so to speak, okay? So it, it was all kosher in that. But, uh, you know, I was seeing uh, reptiles over there and um, and experiencing – That's go my from... next cover story. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, you go over, we were staying at a place that was very near the, the coast, but even, you know, um, it could be 200 yards in from the coast, and depending on what way the house was facing, you try to have all the bedrooms on the coast side because that breeze would come in. If you were on the other side of the house, you know, and your windows faced the other direction, there was no breeze for you. It got real hot real quick, and now you're, you're you know, sweating in your underwear just trying to go to sleep. Um, again, very kosher. I didn't mean anything by that statement. Uh, <laughs> but that's just, you would go in a little farther, you'd go up a hill and now, you know, you're closer to like, you would say the Burma border and the temperature was just different. You're not that far from where we were, where we started from, but the temperature is totally different. Just being up in elevation a little bit. Um, I would say elevation from sea level, um, you know, how the even the jungle itself, you have some areas where the the trees grow really tall. And because they grow really tall, they shade out a lot of the the, sh the shrubs or the, the lower growth that doesn't maybe grow in that area. 
So when the wind actually blows, it can blow through that bottom level because the the actual canopy or the the leafy green stuff is all way up top. Okay, so you're getting a large amount of shade, a good amount of airflow that's going through there. Now other jungles, it's all lower, more compressed, or things have adapted to grow in those different stages, and no winds getting through. And you know you're going to have maybe a whole different set of um, I don't know, fauna and, and whatnot in that kind of environment than you would 10 miles down the road where these other trees tend to grow or whatnot. But somebody help me out here. I'm going to keep running my mouth about all these <laughs> things. Oh, I, uh, so, hey, what do you, uh, what do you feed um, the croc monitors or how do you feed them in the process? And then what do you feed them as well? So the food I think ended up kind of just as important as the temperatures and I, I kind of made at the time what I thought was kind of a neglectful mistake. And then I had actually discussed with two Indo uh, natives that I occasionally chat with. And so when I was cooling them down, they get, they get a little more dormant. You don't see them quite as much. Um, if they're in their cork or doing whatever they're doing, like I'll look and make sure they tongue flick and are moving around. And sometimes, you know, I'll just leave them be. And, uh, you know, one time I, I hadn't seen them in a while. So I, I poked at them to get them to go out and run around. And I looked at the female and I'm like, oh, shit. Like I, I went I went too light on the food. I'm like, she's uncomfortably yeah. skinny. Like I, I, I felt a little bit of shame. Like I, I made a, I made a mistake. Um, mm. And I, I don't know if I would go quite that lean next time, but I actually think that was close to reality. Like one of the things that, that one of these guys told me is that in that dry season, um, some of these animals will go through such a famine that they'll, they'll die of starvation before the, the wet season comes back. Yeah. Um, and then I found later that, you know, I, I still don't know if it's quite the same level of what I did, but, but Kai had said that, you know, he'll, he'll get his down until they're, you know, they look skinny because yeah. that's what it yeah, is. Because yeah. when, when we're going through these conditions, so are their food sources. So they're not eating as much. They're not as active. They're not breeding as much as a result. So they're not available to eat on top of, you know, the reptiles kind of going dormant with the cold you know, also, um, and when I do that, I'll, I'll switch to like really lean food too. So that's what I'm doing. Like, uh, fish, crustaceans, maybe some quail. I really try to stay away from like rats and fatty things through that, through that dry season. Um, and then when we start to warm up, um, I like to spray a lot. John Dragna yells at me. He said that, he doesn't, his monitors don't like being wet and he gives them moisture boxes and stuff like that. But maybe it's just because I, I play with my stuff too much, but they like to drink right out of the hose. Mm -hmm. And I'll go sit in the cage with them and that's what we'll do. They'll, they'll drink out of my hand. Um, uh, so I did that. But then when, when I started to spray the crocs harder, uh, like, like monsoonish, like he would start pursuing the female almost immediately as I left while I was still in the mm -hmm. room. Yeah. So I don't Very know, cool. like, I know, like, when storms come with the snakes, like, a, there's a lot of species that respond to to that, and, and the storms will cause mating, but I don't think that's necessarily related to, to rainfall. I think it's more like a barometric pressure thing. Um, but the crocs definitely, to some extent, responded to that, to that spraying in the water. Um, and then I tied that, you know, just with some heavier feeding, and that's when I would reintroduce... Um, you know, some rodents and some other things. And, man, that female could have eaten me out of freaking house and home. <laughs> like, she – there was a point where she might have been consuming, like, 40 or 50 small prey items a week. Oh, man. Probably more. Yeah. That's insane. That's insane. Um, and, I, and I don't feed big stuff. Like, she could probably eat a large rat if she really tried, but, like – I was feeding like day old chick size things, wean yeah. wings, stuff like that. Stuff that was easy to get down so that it didn't like, you know, really bog them down and they could kind of decide easier where to stop. 
Um, and honestly, the feeding was also kind of engagement too, because, you know, when you're trying to breed them, I don't play with them too much, but you know, the, the feeding gets them to come approach you. And, and that's kind of the time you spend with them instead of, you know, handling and, and things like that. Um, you know, Chris, real quick on that note for the feeding, um, did you, did you notice, or do you notice a difference between feeding birds as opposed to uh, feeding rodents as far as like uh, the weight gain or weight retention with a, with a female? Yeah, I, I think so. It just kind of in general with, with anything, just because the, you know, the rodents are naturally just a little bit fattier and, mm-hmm. and kind of heavier bodies. Like, and it's deceptive looking too, because if you put a day old, chick next to a wean rat they almost look the same right but once something crushes down that chick that chick might as well have been a rat pup or you know right something right. something even smaller at some point um but like maintenance throughout the year when you're not trying to like force a cycling or, or something like that i i just try to kind of heavily base it on you know on the body comp uh What's the word I'm looking for? Composition. Body conditioning. The composition. Yeah. 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 Because, like, I'm sure that, you know, especially Kai or somebody could could probably put together, like, a rough feeding schedule for someone to use that almost without seeing the animal. That could be pretty close to what it should be. But but for me, especially with a wide variety of of things that we keep, I just do it. I do it all by sight. I don't do like it's, this. Adam, this a, snake is eating one medium rat every Monday. Right. I feed it's, whatever, it's all whenever, and I walk. And feeling. Yeah, it's all it's all by looking and getting a feel. You know, if I see that their their tail bases are, you know, sh- during the process, right? If I see that their tail bases are shrinking too much, then I'll go ahead and you know give them a little bit more shrimp or maybe some chicks, but not the yolk part. Um, just some the, the legs and the thigh and you know the head, but I won't really do the whole um, the you know the real the real core of the chick, um, and then you know they'll plump back up and and then I'll I'll find a better baseline then right, um, but I still I've gotten it down to now where um, we are offering food maybe once or twice a week max when when we're at the cooling process part and that's mm-hmm. like the beginning and then the end of the week it's not like monday and wednesday you know it's there's some time to really digest really empty up and things like that so yeah it's uh so one yeah. of those things where it's it's you got to kind of get a feel everybody's conditions are also a little bit different too even if they try to mirror each other, you know, let's just say an animal can work out a lot more or something like that. And then it's going to basically burn through a lot of energy, you know? Um, some people may still allow hotter basking stuff. Um, I, I kind of take the temperatures down a little bit. And um, in the next month here, I think when I get into another couple weeks and, um, I'm going to be doing the same thing again, where in the winter time, um, cause we haven't really gotten there just yet. I think in, at the last week of December, I'm going to go ahead and cool them down for part of December, January, February, part of March. And then March, we end up going back up because it'll be spring anyway. So, yeah. um, that's my, that's my next take on, on these guys, um, they're all. One of them is a, a really great breeder, and she's laid a couple clutches this year, um, you know. But all of them were really infertile, so um, you know it's uh, it's one of those things where she's got a new male in her now. That's a pure Kai Island that I got from Aubrey um, and Mike, and so hopefully we'll be able to utilize that male, um, and then I have a new female with a uh, big Hermes and they're, they have fought before or, or he's grabbed her before really bad. And that was when she was really young though. And obviously I wasn't knowing what I was doing, 
now I'm reading signs a lot better and, and things like that. So, you know, um, really it's just, uh, getting into, getting into the, the ball of things and making sure that I give them this period because I can right now just keep on feeding them, keep on feeding them, keep on feeding them. And then I'll miss my whole chance, you know, and then I'll have to be working with my chance of cold weather is what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, Cause getting into April and, 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 you know, summertime, essentially it'll be too hot to really work with those temperatures. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a thing where I can't miss this opportunity to cool down. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. Especially when you're yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely can definitely use it. The food bill can use it, you know, but you know, going back, it's, funny, kinda, it's like I'm, I'm in the North in Indiana and, uh, you know, it's, it's gotten cold here. It's gotten into the teens already. Um, I got so many damn lights running in this basement that the basement's 70 degrees with no air control. Like I'm going to start turning yeah. this stuff off or I'm not going to be able to get anything cold this year. Yeah. I, I'm assuming, you know, you're going to have a cold side to the, or like maybe where you en enter into the building, you know, where there, there's more airflow, maybe it gets a little colder. I find out that's how I have to kind of, position things sometimes so that it's a little colder up front or uh, build almost like little barriers in my my little space to um, to try to like okay all the warm stuff where the heat's gonna get trapped you're all going towards the back <laughs> you know everything uh, else that yeah. needs to get a little colder up towards the front up towards the doors where it's colder so um, but Chris I, I kind of went off just a little bit when I asked that question over about the feeding with chicks and rats it's just something I I've, I've been noticing. Um, but you know, to get you back on that topic, you were talking about feeding and, uh, how she was eating you out of house and home. And, um, are, are you still going with that method or are you using that along with the temperature cycling? Like if, when you come out of the temperature cycling, are you just going to feed her up or are you just feeding consistently throughout that whole time? So the, when it's cold, I, I go you know, really, really thin, kind of like what Kai said, like once, maybe max twice a week. Um, and then just kind of, you know, slowly ramp it back up along with the temperatures and the humidity. Yeah. And then when we're hot again, then that's when, that's when I pretty much feed the crap out of her and, and see if it'll start to trigger a, a cycling. And she showed, she showed me really well because and it could just be naturally this animal's behavior. This might not speak for everything, but like she's a pretty shy lizard. So like I have to really work with her if I want to um, be able to engage or really even feed her. A lot of times I have to drop feed her and she'll come back to the food. Yeah. Um, but once we're building up to a cycle, she'll chase me out of the damn cage to rip it out of my hands or my yeah. tongs. Um, so you can see like that, that ferociousness and the need for the food, uh, really comes in. And then when she's like really shy or the temperatures are cool, like I might give her three or four chicks and she's done. Yeah. When she's starting to build follicles and cycle, she'll eat a dozen of them. Right. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm noticing um, that, that was right a now. hard thing for me to kind of learn because I hate overfeeding stuff. I hate it. There's so many people <laughs> with fat lizards and fat snakes and they're killing them. And you can't tell me any different. I can't stand it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. A, but, a but doing it with a die. purpose and then having an off season that, that reels them back in, it, it makes a lot more sense. And, and I have logic to it and feel better about it now. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I'm noticing it right now. And even the, with it, along with that question between um, rodents and, and chicks, because my, my female uh, sand monitor, as soon as I come in the room, as soon as I open the door, she's basically running out. And if my shoe's in the way, she's going to taste it, you know, just to see if it's something that she can get down. <laughs> and I'm like, for her size, I'm feeding her like five, six chicks a day. And then I'll go back in there tomorrow and I still see that, that good fold on her sides. I'm almost looking for, for regurgence because it's a little cooler uh, in the, the cage itself. And the male has basically, he's done one of two things. He's either gone down for this cool season, because um, I'm not seeing him much at all, or he's just staying the hell out of her way because he got the signals that, you know, this is my time to bulk up. 
Um, but I kind of thought she would follow suit. So it, it was throwing me off. So I was almost looking for regurges or something going wrong. Like, where is this food going? And then I started, um, I hadn't really seen it myself before. It makes sense. I've heard it before. But, you know, um, between feeding, because it'll take her sometimes a good minute to get a bird down all the way. Just because of the, the shape of her, her mouth, the uh, throat cramming it in there with all that fluff and wings and everything. Whereas a, a similar size rodent is going to go down a lot smoother. So I yeah. made the, the stupid mistake of thinking, well, these are more filling to her because they take her longer to get them down. That's not the case at all. I'm, I'm finding there's a lot more, um, I guess I'd call it like the biscuits and gravy sticking around uh, <laughs> substance in the rodents. So... You know, what, where I want to keep my monitor, like you said, I don't want to overfeed them. I want to keep them lean. The chicks work really good for that. Um, but when it's cycle time, I think I'm going to up the rodent intake to give her those reserves because they seem to stick around a lot better in that instance. Um, otherwise, it's, you know, it's a lot of fluff. It's a lot of feathers, uh, wings, and, and she's digesting those things fine. There's definitely a place for them. But, um, yeah. yeah, I'm going to definitely up It's just them. like misleading in appearance. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, very much so. So, but it's it's a great food for the rest of them that aren't doing anything right now. You know, um, they're keeping the weight great, but obviously she's putting those resources somewhere. So I have a feeling here, maybe towards the end of this month or um, going into January, she's been doing something weird. Well, we'll get into that another time. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that's why I was asking these these feeding questions and what you do. And uh, seeing the the similarities and what's going on with my stuff right now as well, so I'm um, I'm confirming off of you, Chris. You're spitting this stuff out, and I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so take us into well, the next. I, I, I like it, but even the the timing plays out too. Like, um, I argue with with Stephen all the time because he does exclusively rodents. Yeah. And I still won't let him win. I vary my diets. But yeah. that croc that you just saw behind me, he's phenomenal shape because he still manages and watches her body and her tone. And yeah. instead of changing up the food, spaces it out accordingly to, to make sure that they stay balanced. I like um, so I still fight my fight, but it can it can be done from either angle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm with you, though. I'm, I, I do, a, well, I think we all do both. We watch the body composition, you know, see if they're building the right way or getting too chunky in a way. Um, and then I like to feed, you know, a couple different things. I like rodents. If they take the bugs, I'll give them the bug, the bigger guys. If they'll take the bugs, some of them, it seems like they just don't want to bother. They'll kind of look at it and, you know, I'll, I'll go in later on and see them with a couple roaches on their back somewhere or something. They could care less. But, um you know, if they'll take them, I like to vary it up or, uh, you know, use eggs or uh, shrimp or a few other things that I've picked up here and there. Um, for some of them, it just doesn't matter because they're not going to ask the question first. They're not going to take the time to inspect it. It's all food until they find out otherwise. But uh, those are the easy Man. ones to feed. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I, I really like that approach uh, that you're using. And, and you're right. I understand both, you know. Um, if you're going to use solely rodents that they do put on a little more there, they maybe have more substance or definitely fatter, um, you know, use it accordingly. So, uh, that's all, you know, you know, even with the smaller stuff, um, believe me, they love to eat pinkies every day. Uh, but you'll notice it definitely in the, especially if I'm trying to feed up the females, uh, wow. Even when I want them to gain yeah. weight, sometimes it's like, okay, we need to back you off a little. I'm still going to feed you maybe every day, five days a week during this time, but we're going to do it for inches and and not so much the uh, the pinks right now. Because a few of those those uh, ackies, man, they turn into little just chonksters, just <laughs> like you could roll them. <laughs> uh, but okay, okay, let's stick with the Crocs. Okay, Chris. Help me stay on. Maybe I'll mute myself so I, I stop going off on a little tangent. But um, uh, take us through that next part. You know, you're, you're feeding your animals. You're getting that good body weight. You're watching that stuff. What next? 
Um, so when she started to uh, to cycle for me, I had kind of misread the signs a little bit because I just didn't know what she was doing. Um, she went from eating really ravenously to going off food. And she was digging a little bit. So I'm like, oh, maybe we'll get some eggs. Um, come to find out, I think that she, maybe from the, the growth of the follicles or whatever, you know, taking up some some food reserve space is kind of what made her go off food at that point. Because then after three, four days, there was a lot more mating activity. And then she got super hungry all over again. Mm-hmm. Um, now I don't know with them if I just, you know, time things wrong or, or if this goes along with the species, but like, I've heard people get good eggs from secretive mating. They never even saw anything. Mm-hmm. I've seen like people have a mating and they immediately have eggs within like the, the, after the first one they saw in that 30 day window and these things, these things started mating in March last year and made it all the way through July. And I got eggs in August. Yeah. I lost count of the locks. Yeah. So I don't know if it was just, you know, poorly timed and they weren't taking. And that's why they kept breeding because she wasn't showing whatever signs that she was bred. Um, but even right now, uh, after she laid, I put him back in there like three weeks later and I've seen 15 locks. Mm-hmm. And every time I think they're done and I get ready to count down, he gets her again. <laughs> so I don't know if this is a, a habit of the species or if I'm missing uh, something to, to give her that boost to do what she needs to do to, to cut it off. Huh. But it's it's been interesting. You know, I, I can't help but And now I'm right if- in that phase right now in round two. I'm like... This is done. She's not going to lay. It's not going to work. And that's like what I did last time. And then she was like, no, you're an idiot. Here's the eggs. Yeah. No, I, I can't help but wonder if there's um, some natural abilities for, the, you know, sperm retention being one of them. So they can kind of decide uh, until things are right. Or if they are even able to somehow suspend the process within themselves of, um, so maybe eggs are fertilized, but they they have con- more control than we actually realize of the the growth oh, wow. that goes up. Because you know, um, it seems to ha- Tristus throw me all the time, and it I've had some instances with Tristus where I know the animals were separated, but I'll get a good clutch. Or in the past, I've gotten a good clutch two months um, after they were separated for some sort of reason. And I, you know, I've let Kai in on some of these things where it's like, um, uh, they didn't breed for me last year. So this is the two years prior, but I'm digging up cause I, I get these false signs of things. So I'm in there digging every day and I think, Oh, you know what? She's just fat. And then like a good month later, there's eggs and you know, they weren't together. I was trying to give her a break to cool off. So I took the mail out. I actually stuck him in a snake rack for a while. Just said, you, you just sit out <laughs> over here. And, um, you know, as kind of messing around with cooling them down, I was, I had all kinds of ideas going through my head, but, you know, so I wonder, especially hearing this from you and other, um, I guess stories, especially with the, the mid-sized to larger monitors, if there's, they have more ability or if they demonstrate just more ability to maybe control the process within themselves a little better. So, I don't know. So Kai has seen you with like super quick turnarounds from from cycling to mating to eggs, but that's yeah, not always been the case. You had anything like long and suspended like this? Um. Okay. So if I'm counting from last lock, then it's about thirty days max, and it's always roughly to the T. Um, but if I'm counting, yeah, she she laid from, on day thirty. Yeah, so if I'm counting from the very beginning, then sometimes it's like forty days, forty five days, all you know. But that's because they were either mating prematurely or 
basically, you know, it had to take those that week or so of really getting into breeding. Um, you know, and I think maybe once the female starts to develop, the male's going to try to mate anyways, and he's just sort of doing it prematurely, right? Um, and we don't really know because we don't we're not really looking at the follicles too much and things like that. So, you know, maybe um, maybe that time frame we're not really catching it, and and I'm really just hoping that they breed. And then within 20 to 30 days, I get eggs. So that's, that's been my, my, my typical, um, my typical time frame. Uh, has it been longer than that? I think so. Maybe, but only by a couple of days and all, more so because the conditions I had to change up a little bit. You know, I was like, okay, it's now, you know, 25, 27, 30 days and, and she's digging a lot, but she hasn't laid. And then if I see that and I notice that, and I, I kind of see the, the look in the female's face. Also, I'm looking at the tail base. You know, she's kind of just like kind of looking haggard, you know. I'll go and I'll add a little bit more water to the to the nesting site and I'll adjust the 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 position. And then I'll also definitely check the temperature of the nest bin to make sure that's on point two. Um but other than that, you know, it's always roughly been around that that mark. So you know, it's, it hasn't. And I want to really say from like way from too first long. First to eggs, we were over two hundred days. Oh wow, that's a lot. That's a long time. Yeah, that's a long yeah, time. March to August. Yeah, March to <laughs> August. That's so why that so many times I'm like, yeah, this isn't happening. They're just having fun. <laughs> Yeah, so all, all those other times are disregarded, right? It's just then that maybe that that month of breeding before the eggs were laid. Because I, I really don't think it's longer than yeah. that. And it just it just could have been a lot of, you know, things that are in the way, you know. Um, just Poor maybe point. not ready yet. I think not during it. that time when what do you call broke her arm or when you broke her arm. Um, yeah. <laughs> this guy drops a nest bin onto his lady's arm and breaks it. Oh no! <laughs> you hear that story, Alan? You've never I heard, never of that, heard story? that one. But in all fairness, Dude. I'm pretty sure I I caused an animal to break its arm too. So you're not you're not by no, yourself he over broke, here. He broke his wife's arm. Oh, his, his wife? wife's. I thought. <laughs> Dude, I mean, so that's sp- not funny. That's not funny. I Dude, just thought funny. you dropped it on an you animal. Like <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, so... I read it in the nest. It was a bigger nest, and the side <laughs> heat wasn't getting the job done. So I, I decided to add some belly heat to the nest. And uh, this year, I tried those, um, those horticulture mats. And mm-hmm. I like those a lot, because I'm like the heat tape. They can be pinched, and they don't really overheat. They, they have a max that's you know, maybe not good for like a snake rack or something like that, but to penetrate through all this heat or through all this dirt, it, it worked really well. Interesting. Um, so we had this ongoing fight of whose fault it is, and apparently <laughs> we ended with it being my fault since I asked her to help in the first place. Naturally. But naturally. this tub, this tub <laughs> is like somewhere over 100 pounds, maybe more, and I lift up a side of it, and I'm like, I need you to slide this heat mat under this tub. And I'm like, be careful. It's heavy. Slide it in from the side. Do not go under the tub. And it got hung up on some mulch or something like that. And that one second, man, that one second she decided to reach her arm under to flatten this mat out, the damn handle broke off and oh. the tub fell and the handle was still in my hand. Oh, and, man. And she, like, grabbed her arm and ran across the basement and I'm like, oh shit, that's broken. Oh, and she don't want to look at dude. it. And we look at it and man, her arm looked like a cartoon. Oh, I know that. Oh gosh, when you don't want to even look at it. You're like just that, like it. that U-shaped dip in it, like yeah, part of it oh. just fell off. Oh man. And then, and then we get her in the car to go to the hospital and Desiree comes and looks at it and looks at me and she's like, Jade, cover your ears. So, and she didn't because one of her damn arms broken. So she just covers one of her ears and looks at me and is like, 
that looks really bad. And Jane's like, I hope that. <laughs> yeah. That's the crazy. price know, we pay. I know the, exactly the price that people that, pay. That dip, that U shape, and you're just like, oh, it's, that's it's not the, right. It's when it does this. It's yeah. like, you know, when your arms like this, but it yeah. does this instead. Needless to say, if uh, if these eggs hatch, I, I think I owe her mm. the value of one of the babies and whatever mm. medical bills didn't get covered by insurance. <laughs> At least, yep, yep. You got to keep her. She's already been through the fire. You know, she's dependable. Mm. <laughs> oh, man. Thanks for that story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was really that was some crazy times. Crazy, it's like damn, what we got to go through, you know. And uh, I, and I actually, I, had, I put the same mat under the Molina's box, and I'm like, will you come help me with this one? I'll get your other arm. Keeping <laughs> 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 <Just> you <laughs> <me> out. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> I don't keep anything. I think that large. That's the other thing is you're dealing with some some big animals, some heavy duty stuff. I don't yeah. think I, I necessarily have anything that large. Um, you know, if I can't move it myself without hurting my back, then I probably can't keep it. You know, uh, whether it's <laughs> the animal itself. Or yeah, something that thing's it like that's at least a fifty gallon tote. Yeah, or yeah, I've done the bucket hundreds, brigade. Hundreds of pounds. Yeah. I've done the bucket brigade in those big totes before. Cause I do, I have tried some of those before in the, the midsize monitors. Um, and that's what it is. It's just the, the bucket, you know, two buckets at a time, five gallon buckets. That's what I can get in and out with without hurting myself. too bad. <laughs> and man, but it takes all day. And, uh, yep. I need these, these two kids of mine to bulk up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, man. I have, uh, I've tried to, I still have a couple of nest bins in some of the enclosures, but um, the whole in-floor nesting option, man, it's it's a whole different thing. I still have to end up you know, if I need to move that or adjust it, I got to take it all out and put it in a bin, anyways, but or shove it in a large black garbage bag. Um, but for the most part, man, it's it's a lot to shuffle and dig up and add water to it and then dig it up again to make sure it's right. Yeah, it's it's a lot of work, man. Um how are those so PVC ones doing? Does it have temp radiated well? Or do you try uh it? you know they they seem to be okay. Um you know what? To be honest though, I wasn't really gonna say anything only only because they're just kind of sitting there um in the cages and there's only like two of them currently in in place. Um after the water and sand that I use, the it's not that they're – it's just riggedy. It's not that they're falling apart and breaking at all. It's just they're – you know, you can tell it's kind of like a a, 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 cha- a a table with loose legs, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, I think maybe the so design – so, There's so much weight against the walls. Yeah, yeah, that's – so I got to really be careful when I lift it up and and things like that and and work it around because you know when one 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 part of it cracks it basically it gives in through the pressure and then it basically becomes um you know it breaks and stuff like that the the lids though yeah the lids on, on the other hand because so much soil gets in between having to uh, the hinges and stuff like that it's uh, basically kind of trapped. So the hinge kind of is stuck or whatever. And, uh, um, hey. yeah, the hinge is stuck. <laughs> you guys Where'd are good, you... right? It kicked, it kicked me off or it just said, this page yeah. is not working. I was like, oh no. Yeah, it, it was, was like, just, guys, used... <laughs> it's still recording. So go ahead. Don't let me interrupt. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, man, the, the hinges on the roof, they don't really open that well. But that's because there's just a ton of soil and sand and lizard poop just trapped right there. Um, but other than that, I can dig okay. my arm. Yeah, dig my arm in there. Maybe next time when if we make some more, we'll just go through and maybe basically design it a little bit more sturdier. Possibly get some hinges. But I, I, I don't, I don't know. It's 
it's a it's a thing where they work really well as far as look though and how I need to utilize them and placement. It's just that there's a couple things that I would change, you know. I missed some of that. So, um, Kai, but real quick, with those little, they're like PVC boxes, right? Yeah, they're PVC. They're made out of PVC. Um, Chris made them for me. Uh, Is there a way that you could um, just put some either angle supports in there or something that would... Yeah, there's a lot of different stuff we can do. This is kind of like prototype to see yeah. how it would hold up, per se. Gotcha. I've only yeah. made one other one before I sent these out to him, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's I'm different to... supports that we can do. There's cross members that can help. Um, I, I was really thinking that how to, yeah, how to make it better would be a thicker, bigger material. Um, that way, you know, against the, 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 the amount of sand and everything like that, the pressure is, it, it's basically not flimsy at all. Um, and then how they attach to each other. Um, if they're bigger, we might just be able to just button them up against each other, you know, just to screw them in. Um, I don't know how that would work, but if it was a bigger material, we'd have more, uh, screw in place screws more placement for the screws to fit in. Um, and then, you know, cause right now they're still just hooked in by what Lego pieces and a couple of screws. So, you know, they're, they're sort of holding each other in place um, just by how they're, how it's formed. Um, but yeah, man, if I were to redo it a little bit, I'd, I'd change just a couple things. The design is cool. The, the look is great. It's just the mm -hmm. actual like, thickness of the the actual um pvc itself yeah so it's uh the i have a couple that are sitting there and they're not broke they're not breaking or anything and i've i've had to take one out of the cage and carry it across and put it outside for right now um and it's just sitting there it's it's fine but it was you know it was one of those things where dang if it broke and busted it i'd have sand all over the floor and stuff but it didn't it, it didn't though yeah it didn't though <clears throat> Yeah. Oh, dead spot. Dead spot in the podcast. <laughs> no. I was like, who's going to talk next? <laughs> um, so, but Chris, you also mentioned those those horticulture pads because I've looked at those on Amazon. Um, what, what size, like, do you know what you're using right now? Um, let's see. I have, a, I have a big one and I have a small one and I lost my phone. Because I, I have oh, a few I of those... I have a few. Of the, oh, you know what? If if I'm gonna mess you up as far as the uh, you know the recording or the stream or anything, don't worry about it. But I have a couple of those zoom in. No, they're kind of like the cane heat mats. Um, I haven't flipped them on yet because I, I also have a space heater in my room right now. And uh, but I'm I'm gonna flip a couple of them on. But you know, of course, I was always thinking of just laying one of those sideways or fixing it to the uh, side of one of the big um, enclosures. But if you're saying these horticulture mats, there's no problem with like putting them in the dirt, basically up against the wall. Then uh, I definitely and do one's that. And uh, one that I have is is ten by twenty, and the other one I don't know how big the other one is, but it's it's at least at least thirty six inches. The bigger one. And it's worked really good. Um, I have it totally pinched against the ground. That's kind of the point with the the. I think they call them actually like plant mats or seedling mats. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they're basically meant to go under, you know, like the plant trays, and probably not as much weight as this. Right. Um, but it's different because like the like the heat tape that we use like specifically needs to breathe. Yeah. Like if you've seen people that have like those those garbage racks where like the heat tape is just taped down and it's making direct contact with the tubs and you've seen it like melt tubs and stuff like yeah. that. Um haven't had that issue at all. This thing never it doesn't have a ton of power. Um so it never really fully hits its set point, but I can say even with it running 24/7 since July 
I jacked up the tub and looked under it the other day, and there's there's no damage to the plastic at all. Not on nice. the cage, not on the tub. And nice. it's had, I said 100 pounds, but it's got to be more than that because I couldn't pick up both sides. It's got to be like 300 pounds almost. So, so this is in a tub just straight at the bottom, not up against a, like the one of the sidewalls? Yeah, so I do I do side heat too. Okay. Um, but with the size of this nest box that I was doing, the side heat just wasn't radiating far enough to give the gradient that I wanted. So I ended up doing side and belly this time. Okay. Interesting. All right. All right. Um, yeah, because so for the side, I'm still using regular heat tape on the side, and then I just have a um, uh, basically like a, a board in place that would stop the the lizard from getting to it, but it still lets some air exchange. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like it. I'd rather build something prettier than that. This is pretty janky for what I have the ability to do as a cage maker, but I serve other people. I don't do shit for myself. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> you know, cause I'm asking also because I have one of those big, like, I want to say they're the 55-gallon you know, Home Depot totes, or I bought two of them, and to try out something once, uh, the first time I just put it in a certain position in the cage where I knew it would stay in a certain um, temperature gradient, but the second time I tried it out, I had two of them, and I tried the little, like, um, heat mat nest bin method where you stack them up together, and uh, so you have two Damn. totes, and then that second one is the that bottom one, you're using that space basically to put the, the heaters in there. And the idea is to heat the tote above it full of dirt. Unfortunately, what I found out was then piling in, you know, that amount of weight to fill it up, that top one, it actually cracked the one below it. So then dirt slowly uh, leaking out and everything. So that, but that only happened on those, those big ones, those long ones. I've never had it happen on the, uh, you know, the 12 gallon. I, I'm assuming it wouldn't even happen on the, um, some of the 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 twenty gallon maybe because of the just the construction the rigidity of it but on that long one um, I forget it might be more gallons than that I think it's fifty five inches long if I'm not mistaken that sounds huge but I think it's around that it's like seventeen by seventeen by maybe fifty fifty five I forget but yeah it was it was too much weight somewhere in that and it it cracked so that's why I was asking about how you yeah. set it up in there. I get I get nervous looking at that big tub too because sometimes it'll try to belly out and it'll pop the lid off. Yeah. And I, yeah. I keep waiting for it to crack. I I zip tie some of the lids because they have those little holes up top, and um, I I try to zip tie part of them, and then so you know I'll go through a bag of zip ties. So one side will stay zip tied, uh, usually the far side that I'm not reaching into, and then. <laughs> I'll uh, zip tie the other part and just get in there every once in a while when I, I think I got to dig for something. So I'm just cutting up off, off a, you know, a two cent zip tie. And, uh, but for that, that's same actually reason, really smart. I'll probably do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, for, for that same reason, try to keep that lid on there. So, um, but yeah, interesting stuff. I want to try, I've always wondered about that. So I'm glad somebody else is trying it out there. Before I uh, put the money into, see, you're trying to, what? What are those things running like? Twenty, thirty bucks for those heat mats? Yeah, I think that was that was just about right. Okay. The, um, let's see. Here's a, a ten by twenty that's thirty dollars and comes with one of those little inkboard thermostats. If you already have one, yeah, here's a two pack for twenty nine dollars. Oh, not bad. So not. That's not bad. So I like the idea that you shared with me is more expensive than the idea I shared with you because my zip tie thing is, yeah, about two cents a zip tie. So you keep trying the more expensive stuff. I'll try the cheaper stuff. We'll, we'll share those ideas. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, okay, so we talked about um, you're back staying with the Crocs and how you have that set up. Um, is, is that... I, I'm trying to go back, Kai. I'm trying. Um, is that what they? Is that the setup that they laid in this last time? What's that? Oh, with that nest thing, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good stuff. And um, you know, you, you said before. I think we were recording. 
that you were having some drop off as far as the eggs. How many eggs did you originally get? Eleven. Eleven. Okay. And so and we're down out to of those eleven, have you candled them? It's been it's been that long now. They should have full full development veins and everything now. Yeah, the six the six look good. I'm still. I don't know why I can never throw the maybes away. Some of them look so bad, but they're still in they there. Have, in they have veins? <laughs> they have veins? The good Those ones, ones don't. The good ones do. Yeah. That's good. Because so, we're all so in this man. same toxic relationship, Chris, where it's like <laughs> they treat us so bad, and yet we're, we're these optimistics that things will get better. It's very toxic. <laughs> these, ugh. We even deal with the smell sometimes. Like, this thing would be black and slimy and nasty and <laughs> hit you in the face. And we're like, but there's a chance. <laughs> and I, I've seen some real ugly eggs hatch of some different species. So like, True. Uh, True. Yo, I don't know, I yo, guess. Yo, Chris, I had a, I had a question because you could deal with a lot of imports and stuff. Uh, I think, Alan, you might be able to help, too. Um, you guys ever ever use um, deworming medication on your guys' stuff? Yeah. What do you guys yep. use? Yeah. I do more so on, on snakes than lizards. Um, yeah. Just because I've seen the snakes crash a lot harder and faster, especially imports. Yeah. Um, but typically something like uh, like Panicure, the 10-Benzol, Okay, is my my starter, and then I'll move on to um, like a like a flagell metronidazole type thing if needed, just because it goes after a few different parasite species. If it doesn't seem like your issue's been eradicated, right? That's that's exactly what I had to do. Um, was pancure, and then um, there was still one animal that just would not gain weight, so we went for the the flagell method. It seemed to knock it out. Um, for that specific animal, weight gain started coming back. And, and the panicure so. is so, like, I've had vets tell me you could overdose 10 times the yeah. amount and the animal would be fine. Like, it's one of the most safest. Uh, is, it re- is it really or no? It's not right. Yeah, no, no it, it, it really is. is. It's water-soluble. Whatever doesn't get used passes right through them. Um, it is easy okay. to dose for what it is, but as far as, like, Self-administration goes definitely one of the safer things to to work with. Uh, yeah, well, I got one of the one of the imports, um, the the Russells. I don't know if it's got. I've been watching it poop and stuff like that. I think it's just the fact that it's not eating meat in the chicks, that it's not growing like the other one is, but it's definitely put back on weight in its tail base and legs and then even in its gut. It just I don't know if I don't know if I should do it yet or or at all. Um, you know, only because it's really only eating bugs, right? Um so maybe you know, maybe I just gotta gotta see if I can trick it to eat other stuff. Um it'll I've seen it buy the food dish, but I never really see it eat and, and do that. But Man, if I give it a grasshopper and put it to its face, it's on. It's on it immediately. It's it's weird. I know it eats the superfood. Yeah. I know it eats, but it just doesn't want to eat other stuff. So I find it went myself to the right like, place. Then <laughs> <laughs> I know shit because it would have been dead. Uh, it would have been dead, man. A lot. Of, I've been trying to get everybody to buy all those up, so that way I know where they are and and. Um, and things like that and so just uh trying to make sure that those guys go to at least decent homes that are buying them up um those russell those russell islands they're really cool they're a lot nicer i mean they're basically just a, a solomon island with a little bit more to them you know that's really it they, they still basically got the 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 pattern of the solomon Island. okay they got a little bit more yellow in them but you know um for the most part they they turn out looking a lot like a Solomon Island, um, just just a bit, a bit, a little bit extra in coloration. Um, but yeah, man, you know, I, I hope I hope they hang around. I would say um, 
just from, and I think Chris, you brought in a lot more stuff than I have, but it, I was faced with a couple of these little situations where it's like this animal, um, figure out what I was going to do. And it, so do I keep letting it eat or trying to get it to eat? I had one that I went back and forth with, back and forth with. Um, but I would say there's no harm in the panicure getting that into that system, uh, yeah. knocking out whatever that is capable of knocking out. Um, but then also just stick with that animal. Um, I had, I had, well, the blue trees, you know, um, those blue trees did not want anything but roaches for almost a year. That's all they wanted to, to eat were roaches. And I couldn't put them in a small bin either. I had to put them in like a bigger, like a 10 inch or so like dog dish so they could actually be above them and actually see the roaches move around. Yeah, and man. You know, you let you let Dubia sit too long, and uh, it's like they just become frozen. They stop moving. So yeah. I almost had to dump those yeah. back in the bin, get ten new yeah. ones out, put those in there, and um, but this went on for like a good year, um, mm-hmm. and their their weight never really. It wasn't where I wanted to because of that. But then after that year, they started taking. Um, I'd let a, a live mouse, a small mouse, loose in the cage. And just go looking for that one small mouse. And then uh, I don't know if it was one was bold enough to try it, and then the others learned that they could eat that. But now I can feed chick parts. I can feed um, mice. I can feed a lot of other things. But it it took a year of them not want anything but those dubia. And what's funny is that wasn't the case from uh, the guy that I got the originals from. They were fine, yeah. but in, in that's so mice, weird. I've seen that with a lot of things. Like, what changes that all of a sudden? They don't want certain foods. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it surprised me. Um, but now you know they're they're locked on again, um, and the rest of the the actual imports, fresh imports that I brought in, you know oh. they, um, yeah, they're all eating um, mice and chicks now. And uh, but it was the same thing with some of the the the. Uh, Green trees and the, wow. the black trees that came in, they just wanted bugs at first. Once it seemed like they got comfortable after about, for some of them, it was, it was within a month. Some of the other ones is maybe six months or so. Um, it's like they hit a different comfort level. And then they would, it almost timed right at the same time that they were starting to take stuff off the tong. So I don't know if it was just a, uh, I don't know. I have all kinds of thoughts. Like maybe they think that's too big. That puts them in too much of a vulnerable position to work down something like that, mm. as opposed to just a bug where it's like they got it. They can still be safe. They can cram that down. I don't know. So yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Where they don't feel tied to a prey item and then therefore vulnerable. But that's just my own thoughts. I can't. I have nothing to back that up with. So, but uh, yeah, I remember this. But I say that that panicure. There's no problem using it. it nothing ever. Everybody got that that came in with that. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to figure out if I, because I normally don't. I, I I typically, well, I typically get in animals that have already been imported. So maybe they've been panicured then, um, and then you know I I would just buy stuff that would have come from somebody else that's already been long term captured. Um, but you know these are obviously pretty fresh. Um, I think the Dwyer I were here for so long that they have already been accustomed and adapted, and maybe they were panicured then. Um, but these guys, I don't think they were at all. So I may have to um, hit them with some, one of them. I might have to hit it with something. And it's just the the same panicure they sell. It's that white and blue box, mm-hmm. right? Okay. And, you know, I, I would agree. Yeah, I like just, to um... – Oh, go ahead, Chris. We use Panicure because that's a, a, a generic name that everybody knows, but I, um, I actually like the uh, I like the Safeguard better. Yeah, okay. I use that stuff. Um, it's still Fenbendazole, same thing, same active ingredient as Panicure. The only reason I like it is uh, Panicure is like a thick paste, mm-hmm. yeah. and the Safeguard is a liquid. So I, I okay. like it because you can draw it up in a syringe and you can inject it right into a food item. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that's probably, that's probably what I'm going to have to do. I'll probably have to have you uh, give me a, a link to one of those where I can go and get it. it. It's pretty simple to get over the counter, or it has to go through yeah. your fed? No. Over, nope, the, over counter? the counter? Okay. 
Yeah, if you have like a tractor supply or a rural king or something like yeah, that, yeah. easy to easy to get. Thief guard as well, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. At, at, at the tractor supply, and right? Like a, I think it's like a green, yellow, and white bottle, but I'll, I'll get you a link to it to show you. And I'll show you the dosing too. All right. Cool. And I would say, I would say, even if they came from somewhere, um, do it again because there's that whole thought. One, I don't think it's going to hurt them, like Chris was saying. Uh, it's hard to overdose on that stuff. I don't think it's going to hurt them. Um, and two, even from where they came, you don't necessarily know those conditions. And also yeah. the, the stress process of this originally a wild caught monitor then maybe establishing somewhat wherever they were at and then the stress of then coming to you in a whole new environment, you know, you've given yeah. those um, parasites sometimes a chance to, to take hold with that stress. So if you can get ahead of that a little bit. Um, yeah. But if, if they're already eating fine, then, you know, take that into consideration too. But if you have that, that iffy one. Yeah. It's, then, uh, it's eating. It's just, uh, maybe it's just cause it's not eating anything else. It, it eats every day. It has put back on weight in its tail. So that's why I haven't really been like, okay, I got to go and do something now. But, um, you know, sometimes it's like, man, you, you look really skinny, bro. Like, what the hell? You know, but its tail base is back to being plump and, you know, not so sucked up like how when I first got them. So it's, you know. Well, and that's uh, the other side of it is like people kind of have this panic attitude of, oh, my God, parasites. We have to get rid of the parasites. We have to get rid of the parasites. Yeah. No, every single wild reptile that exists has parasites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They all have parasites, yeah. all of them, and they're living just fine. Right. When it's they the come balance. here, it's the, the stress that compromises the immune system that lets the parasites take hold. So, like, right. a lot of times if you can get something in – and acclimate it well, and it has a lot of hide options, and it's and it's comfortable. It still has the parasites, but it's it's balancing just fine. It's a healthy a healthy gut level of them. And I kind of feel like if you were to, and it would be really hard to do anyway, but if you were to eliminate one hundred percent of the parasites in a wild caught animal, I would think that its immune system would either crash or turn on itself. Absolutely, yeah. I agree. Because now everything about that gut fauna is interrupted and that immune system that has spent its entire life fighting parasites now has an unprecedented break to do what? Boom. <laughs> kind of a kind of a weird place to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. On on that other um Real quick tangent, I'll keep it quick. But as far as food items, too, you know, if they're eating a certain thing, they're used to that gut fauna, whatever's going on over in that part of the world, then they come here. And even though we have, um, you know, mass-produced rodents or chicks or whatever, there's still different things in those foods that we don't take in it. They don't affect us. They don't affect our animals in any way. But it's different for that animal. And so um, – yeah. They have to learn to, to work with that stuff. It's like it, for I try not, but but because we're all we're all mammals or animals to some degree, we're all living things that have to, to deal with these things. Um, you know, I, I when I mentioned I went to Thailand, uh, I was over there for a little while. And when I came back to the U.S., uh, the very first thing I wanted was an In-N-Out burger. And when I was over in Thailand, I was eating a lot of their, like, super fresh foods, a lot of vegetables, you know, just uh, rice, um, the meat that they had over there. Had a couple issues early on over there, but then, uh, you know, everything kind of regulated. And then when I came back over here and I ate this In-N-Out burger, man, I got sick to my stomach. I thought it was going to be the best thing in the world, but it took me a little while to kind of adjust back. Because yeah. um, you were eating jungle food. And yeah, then you were, good too. you were eating, and then you were eating just the regular American processed, septic clean food. Right, right, right. And so, you know, I think there's maybe something to that. If we'll ever know, I don't know if we'll know in our lifetime. Maybe as things progress, as the uh, people look into this kind of stuff more specifically with the animals we keep, then uh, we might get a better idea. But um, uh, I, I do think there has to be some truth to that. If they're used to eating this type of um, maybe these four types of bugs on a normal basis, maybe 
these rodents or fish or whatever. And the stuff over there kind of shares the same, um, I wouldn't even know what the word would be, you know. Um, Bacteria. Yeah, yeah. Same. They're from the same environment. They're all dealing with it together. And then plop them over here where we're feeding them farm fresh chicks or something and you know, it's just uh, maybe it's a different strain of salmonella or you know what whatever it is. Um, yeah, exactly. But, yeah, yeah. You can throw them off their off their game. So, um, but it's you know it's our Saturday. I know we're busy, guys. I don't want to cut things too short, but at the same time, we're we're almost that two hour mark. Uh, we got a little more croc information out of me jabbing my or, you know running my mouth. Uh. But Chris, anything, and I guess before we get out of here, that you want to just add to to what you're doing, or you know, um, you you know, we can I ask this? It's real controversial sometimes for people. But what size are you allowing these animals? What what, what enclosure size are you giving to these animals? Uh, so like that um that big male, that one that I showed you that like get on my lap to take that that rat. Mm-hmm. He's uh, gosh, he's probably in a ten by twelve by nine. Woohoo! So, so he's, he's got a whole room. <laughs> yeah. Um, Good stuff. The funny thing is, so the the pair that I bred, and I'm I'm not advocating for this. It's just ironic. Is um, I I bred them in an eight four six. It was meant to be a temporary cage because I had moved. I hear a lot of this more often than not. Actually. Yeah, I I do it here with the mangroves. Right. They they seem to do a little bit better. Say that again, Chris. I said, and I'm not I'm not thrilled about it. I'm looking forward to moving them into the cages they were intended for, but the behavior has lined up so perfect the whole time. I haven't wanted to bother. Yeah. Yeah, I you know a, a buddy here in Southern California, uh, he uh, bred the black trees, basically setting them up in temporary uh, enclosure type of things, getting ready to go to their next home, and then they start that reproductive cycle. And he's like, "Oh, hold on, they can't go just yet. I don't want to interrupt this." And sure enough, they bred <laughs> for him. So, um, so I'm, and, I'm yeah, definitely going to pursue the big cages still. I, I hope that I can uh, replicate what I did in the smaller space. I do think part of that probably was contributed to the fact that conditions are easier to regulate in the smaller space. Yeah. yeah. But the behavior of my, of my big boy in that giant cage, it's so different. Yeah. He was such a nightmare, absolute nightmare animal to deal with. And the fact that I could just walk in there, close the door behind me, sit down, watch him spray. Him. I eat my lunch in there with him. Oh, nice. That's how we get to know each other. That's nice. Um, you know, that, that's, that's how I want them all to be eventually. And I'll, I'll find a way, even if I have to sell some stuff, because it's it's awesome. Yeah. I can totally understand that. Um, and then we might have covered it the last time, but for your Crocs, the way you're keeping them throughout the year, what, what temps are you trying to achieve for both their basking spot? And we went into cold temps a little bit, but on, a, on your day-to-day, you know, what, what are you trying to, to accomplish there? So some of that has to do with, with the cage sizing because I just kind of like to give them choices. Like when you watch them, they'll, they'll go and pick what, what they want to do. Right. So like in that big cage, I have the ability and honestly lack of ability to, to impact some of it. Lack of um, ability, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like I, they still, there's still a cool area in there that I'm, I'm sure is, you know, pretty close to, you know, 70, maybe even a tick in the high 60s, even when I crank the heat up. Um, but there's so much other variety. And I think I showed you that picture where, like, there's that mesh ledge where you can fit under that skylight. Yeah. In the, in the morning, that's stupid cold because the cold radiated through that glass. Yeah. But then when the sun hits it, that spot turns into like 85, even if the room's not 85. Awesome. Uh, for the basking, though, I don't go, I don't go that high with them. There's some people that, that kind of still argue the fact with me, but I've tried the, the 130, 140 basking, and they. 
closer to like 110, 120. Yeah. They'll go and they'll warm up and, you know, they'll sit there for 15, 20 minutes and then they'll go, go on about their thing. Um, I always kind of felt like if they're sitting in a basking spot all day, that's your cue that it's, it's not hot enough. You need to pick yeah. it up. Because it's, it's meant to be a, a bask, not a hangout. Right. So I feel like they're not getting the heat they need if they sit there all day. But then if they're avoiding it altogether, I feel like it's it's too much. So I've tried to find that that level ground going up and down of like when do they do they use this? Like when they, when they have a meal, do they go up there and, and sit for a half hour or whatever to digest? And and that's kind right. of where I found them using it the most that way, like one ten, one twenty. Yeah, you know nice. I. I try to point this out to a lot of the, the Aki keepers that I'm, you know, in contact with or have sold animals to is uh, they want to get the, the soil right because Aki's burrow and they're going to burrow and now they're underground and how much they like to dig and be under their burrows and, and whatnot. And I'm like, well, I actually see mine. Through most If I'm in the room, they're usually out looking at me, you know? And uh, if yours are under the ground the whole time, it's not because they, they're these super burrowing animals. They're not moles, you know? Maybe it's too hot. Maybe too you're hot. not, yeah, set up the right way. Um, you know, break it to them gently, like, hey, try this, try that, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, but interesting that, again, reading the animal, not only like we were talking about the body composition, but also their behaviors, their habits, and what they're doing. So, um, so for a few, because I've had a couple people reach out just after the last episode, uh, big fans of you, just to let you know whether they've reached out to you or not. Um, but also, uh, you know, huge fans of the, that iconic croc monitor. So they want the step-by-step guide. And I'm like, ah, I don't I don't think you're going to get that. But uh, uh, if, if Chris wants to give it to you that way, then I'll, he's the one doing it. So I'll let him talk to it. But, uh, yeah, kind of in line with, hey, you got to you got to think on your feet and, um, you know, you got to you got to assess what's going on and learn to read your environment, your animals, your everything that's going on with them a little bit. So. Yeah, that's good stuff. And and Chris, how long? Again, I, we asked you last time, but how long you've been doing it? How long have you been reading animals for? The, the, the croc. I've worked with the crocs for about five or six years, but I've I've kept reptiles in general. Probably, I think this is like year twenty two, twenty three. Nice. So I don't um, want to. The crocs were something like since the beginning. I I knew I always wanted, but the resources are just yeah. It's it's astronomical to to truly maintain them, and I didn't know that I'd really get that opportunity. <clears throat> but life kind of fell together right, and I swung for the fences with it, and knocked out a bunch of other projects to make room for them, and it was worth it. Yeah, yeah, I, I bring that up because I I know there's there's the enthusiasts out there, there's the potential keepers. They want to go straight to uh, well, I'm going to keep croc monitors, but that's all I'm going to keep, and I'm going to work. Hey, I don't want to discourage you, but when you're getting imports like that and then high dollar animals, you know, um, and you haven't necessarily developed that eye for for seeing things, or even, unfortunately, maybe as in our case, uh, when you're losing an animal, when an animal's spiraling, what's the difference between an animal just going down for a little bit or choosing to to go cold or um, you know, whatever that behavior is, and what's an animal actually spiraling? What's a what's a, a critical animal? What, you know, what's the difference there? And um, um, so not trying to discourage anybody. We're all in this hobby together doing our thing, but um, these are some of those important lessons maybe before jumping in. And, and I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of it, okay? So, <laughs> um but learning these little, the scariest learning. thing for for me with the people is is just interacting with them in in general like people read that they're dangerous they hear they have big teeth like yeah it, when when you're face to face with it and if you've seen somebody get an actual bite from this species I don't. I don't want to recommend them to anybody that I that I don't know personally. When I sell yeah. a croc, it feels like I'm selling something venomous. Yeah, actually. And then they that's... see me with them on my head and my shoulder and sitting on my lap and stuff, and I'm like, 
one, I, I, I know the animals very well, but that's still not ruling out that something could happen to me. Mm-hmm. I've, ex- I've accepted an outrageous risk every time I put my hands on those things. Yeah. Every time I drop a rat in there with a set of tongs, I've accepted yeah. that I'm going to lose a finger one day. Like, that, that's on the table every time that, that I decide to interact with them the, the way that I do. Um, and I've consciously accepted that. If that happens, I'm going to go deal with it. I'm going to be calm. I'm not going to get media attention. I'm not going to post it online. I'm going to accept the consequences, and I'm going to come back home and take care of my lizards. Yeah. See, when I was at the very beginning, when you had that animal on your shoulder and I was recording you, I was going through that same situation in my mind. It's like, if I see him get bit right now, how much could I sell this for? And what are my moral values? (laughs) (laughs) YouTube. Yeah, I guess. All right, guys. We are at that two-hour mark. Um, I, I obviously we're going over a little bit, but when I chose it, uh, the new format of this, I, I kind of had to put a start and end time. So I don't know if it kicks us off at a certain time or whatnot. But um, Chris, we would love to have you back again. Um, you know, talk some more animals anytime. Um, you know, and, and I know this is a modern keeping podcast, but if you ever want to talk about scrubs or any of the other cool stuff, I can put Kai on mute. I think as Part of my tools on here, and he can deal with that. I'm kidding. Um, I think he um, had a snake but, once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't I really like too much. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk he's bearded got a, dragons. Yeah, he's got a bearded dragon. I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, they're fun. They're just so you know what they uh, one of, one of the the best things that I've ever seen Kai post, and Kai, you can requote it for me because I don't remember the words, but. It basically started with somebody being like, you're the monitor guy. Why are you bothering with just a oh, yeah. just a bearded dragon? Yeah. <clears throat> but like, you know, uh... Kai, I wrote a paragraph, you know, indirectly lighting that guy up of just the, the value of, of every animal. And honestly, these these high these these popular market animals that everybody's used to keeping and setting up and engaging with the same way, yeah. Um, I think that the, the more Kai posts this thing, you're going to see, you know, the the most basic animal in the pet trade. You're going to see acting and doing things differently than they do from every other one of these basic keepers. Right. Yeah. Hey man, don't 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 hate the bearded dragon guys like. Uh... Guys like uh, Ron St. Pierre produce uh, thousands of bearded dragons every year, man. You know, and he's one of the very high, highly looked at, you know, individuals in the hobby. And I, I don't know, there's, there, we all start from somewhere, but even then, it's like not even like a low level animal or anything. It's just it's, bearded dragons, if you have been paying attention to the market or, you know, how things go, you know, it used to be like what, Sure, we, we, they stopped kind of at like, you know, citrus and reds, but now the morphs have basically taken off on them as well. So they've stayed relevant, even if you know, even if not. So what is that? A leopard gecko? What is that? Oh, I can't. I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, Alan's got a bunch of basic pets for his kids, just regular, simple stuff that they can raise, you know, geckos, things like that. I'm waiting for him to come back so so he can tell us. <laughs> Just trying to figure out what's wrong with his volume. But um, yeah. but that's just the point. Is like people coin that stuff as as basic, but like yeah, yeah. Every I mean, reptile has has depth, and if you work with it differently, set it up different, give it everything it's designed to use, like yeah. it can turn that table really quick. I literally raised this bearded dragon like it's a monitor lizard. You know, it's got it's got crazy high basking temperatures. You know, it has the normal fixings for a bearded dragon. You know, the UV lights, the things like that. But 
it, it's I care for it like how I care for the the monitor lizards almost to the T, you know, other than other than the diet and the normal parameters. But <clears throat> this lizard gets to have uh, a lot of climbing areas, uh, maximum usage of the surface areas. You know, it, it gets to eat a variety of foods. Um, it probably has one of the best diets in all bearded dragons in the USA. So, you know, it eats, it eats just about everything. Um, and, you know, I uh, I apply even the same, because it's mean, I apply the same methods that I use to um, tame the monitors and, and how to help the monitors the same way as I do the um, the bearded dragon that's also very aggressive. So it looks like I have to close this one out because because Alan's uh Alan's basically done. So um, yeah, yeah, he's uh he's uh he's off. So uh, all right, um, you'll be able to find Alan in places on Instagram under Origins Reptiles, and you'll also be able to find Alan on Origins Reptiles on Facebook as well. Um, and if you need to, you can. Find him here at the Monitor Keeping Podcast or Monitor Keeping Podcast on um, the Morelia Python Network, right? And um, before we get into closing out, uh, Chris, where can people find you? All right, so it's really just under my name on Facebook, Chris Foley, um, and then on Instagram, um, the, Amethyst, the Amethystina Project. It's mostly my scrub pythons, but since I've backed out of that a bit, there'll be some monitors and some other things on there too. All right. And uh, for me, uh, you'll be able to find me mostly on Facebook under Kaifan. Um, if you look up Mangrove Mecca on places like YouTube and or Facebook, you'll be able to find my other pages as well. Um, and then you'll find me on Instagram under big underscore lizard 103. But um, I'm most responsive on Facebook. So you can just look up Kai Fan and find me there. Um, but before we get out of here, I'd like to thank uh, Eric. I don't know if we'll have more episodes up until Christmas. So we're just going to say Merry Christmas now. And thank you to Eric Burke at, at um, you know, just uh, the, the NPR network and everything like that for everything he's done for us, uh, putting this together, and it's editing our me- <laughs> our mess. And uh, really, you know, really getting the monitor aspect of keeping out there just because there's not a whole lot of uh, monitor podcasts themselves. So uh, thanks, Eric. And uh, happy holidays to everybody that is listening to this. All right, you guys. Peace out. And on behalf of Alan, Alan says goodbye as well. See you guys later. All right. Thank you, guys.